relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. And I want to share with you um, something of an experience that I had two weeks ago, which opened up again another uh, area of study that I believe is very essential. It's very critical now uh, for Muslims in you know, our life here in uh, Canada and throughout the world. Uh, last uh, two weeks ago, I visited um, New Jersey. I did a course on the companions of the Prophet ﷺ in Newark, New Jersey. And I spent a little bit of time in a place called Patterson, New Jersey. And Patterson, New Jersey, quiet as it's kept, has um, the second largest Arabic-speaking population in the whole of North America. It's the second largest. The largest Arabic-speaking community in North America is in Dearborn, Detroit area. And the second largest uh, is there in New Jersey. And that's something that I was not aware of myself, even though I am from America originally, but I was not aware of the extent uh, of the community there. Also, in Newark, New Jersey, uh, there is one of the strongest indigenous Muslim communities. I mean, uh, uh, American people, African Americans, white Americans, Hispanics, who have become Muslim. It's one of the strongest communities also in North America in terms of numbers. In the city of Newark, New Jersey, uh, especially in the uh, African American community, uh, some people say maybe 75% of the people have either accepted Islam at some point in their life, or somebody in their family accepted Islam, or somebody who they know is a Muslim. So in other words, Islam is a familiar thing. And when you walk the streets as a Muslim in the Newark, New Jersey area, uh, you don't feel strange at all. And people do not feel strange with your presence. But what I noticed from the brothers and sisters who are there, it again, is a type of frustration. It's a type of frustration because even though we have large numbers, even though we have masajid, even though we have access to a lot of information, we don't feel that we're getting the results that we deserve to have. And this is similar to the Muslim world itself when we look at uh, our populations, 26% of the, of the Earth's population. We look at uh, some of the richest people on Earth. We look at countries in strategic positions. But yet, there is something on the inside that we're not doing. And as we cry for change, as we cry for political change, and as we cry for economic change, we cry for social change, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has very clearly told us in Surah Al-Rad, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. And so the first major change that we as individuals and the ummah has to go through is an internal one. It's an internal one. So there's something inside of us that we have to correct. Everything else is in place. It's not about numbers. It's not about youth. OK, we're, we're, we're ready, but we have to ignite something inside of ourselves. We have to correct something inside of ourselves in order to get victory. And the great Khalifa Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar al-Khattab, when he wrote a famous letter to Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, when he sent him to the Persians, and he told them that when you face a large enemy like this, the most important issue is not numbers, because they outnumber you. The most important thing is not weapons, because they have better weapons than you. The most important thing is your character and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if our character is better than them, if we are closer to Allah azza wa jal, then Allah will give us victory on the ground. But if we are similar to them or worse than them, then they will be victorious over us because they have the numbers and they have the weapons. And so look to yourself first. Look to uh, what, what are we doing wrong? How can we correct ourselves? 
and how can we improve? And one of the brothers uh, who I was traveling with, a Palestinian brother, Jazawla Khair, a very nice uh, young person coming up, was, was, was telling me about the history of Patterson and what they're going through there. And that the, the people, because of the Muslim presence, people would uh, sleep early in Patterson. In 9 or 10, um, stores would be closed and people would be sleeping and whatnot. But now some changes are happening. And a new fitna, a new plague has come. And I want to, as we go into this discussion, to make the young people aware of this, this new plague. And that is the plague of the hookah pipe. There in Patterson now, they've introduced shops where they are smoking the hookah. And you put inside of it shisha, right? You put shisha inside of it. And the hookah has spread so much that now, instead of sleeping early, people stay up uh, smoking this and socializing and whatnot. And so now people go home at 3 in the morning. And now even it spread to women, where women are smoking it in hijab. And so the harm that has come to the community is that criminals from outside of Patterson who would have never come in the evening in that area now see the lights on and people there. So criminal activity is entering into the Muslim community. And also the non-Muslims who are there, um, they, um, they, there's, a, there's a wrong perception of what Islam actually is. Because, you know, in the non-Muslim countries, especially the countries where um, uh, it is Christian-based countries, uh, a woman wearing uh, hijab is a holy thing to them. And even though they've left Christianity to a great extent, in the back of their mind that somebody who wears that is a, a pious person. But somebody who smokes a pipe is not a pious person in this culture, right? That person is a drug addict or a gangster. So they can't put the thing together and they get the wrong image uh, concerning Islam. The problem Muslims are facing is that sometimes there are issues which are upon us that are not so clear. They're not so clear. And in this case, we need to have uh, guidance. This is how we're going down. In many places, we're not going down because of straight out haram things, but we are going down or we are uh, uh, failing because of things that are, uh, uh, have shubha. They have doubt inside of it. And in the light of this, and in the discussion that we had, a particular hadith uh, came up um, that I have within my 40 hadith of Islamic revival. I have it as hadith number five, but it is a well-known famous hadith. And this hadith um, deals with the issue of the shubha, of the doubt. Because somebody will say, well, I'm smoking the shisha pipe. It's not hashish. So it's not intoxication. And it has nice sweet smell. And even the, hashi even the shisha now will have coconut. Or it has vanilla. Or it has rose. So it has a nice fruit smell. So they say, no, these are fruits. What is wrong with the fruit? And they say there's water in it because the bubbly, right? The hubble bubble. So the water now cleans anything that is wrong in it. And it is a nice, clean um, type of um, beautiful smell. Uh, itta, incense, type of frankincense, which is going before, which is going into your lungs, and it makes you happy, and you enjoy yourself and whatnot. That is the shubha. That is the doubt. And many times, drugs and things which appear to be, which are evil, when they come to us, they come in a nice package. As they will call, they used to call drugs, they have uh, ecstasy drugs, and they have, you know, names that they will give to the drugs, and their actions are good names. But the Prophet ﷺ in authentic hadith, an norman ibn Bashir, um, he said that he heard the Messenger of Allah ﷺ say, uh, saying, Al halal ubayin wal haram ubayin. Wa bayna huma mushabbahatun la ya'lamuha kathirun minan nas. Fa man attaqa al mushabbahat 
istabra'a li dinihi wa irdi wa man waqa'a fi shubuhat qara'in yar'a hawla al-hima yushiku an yuwaqi'u ala wa inna li kulli malikin hima ala inna hima Allahi fi ardihi maharimu ala inna fil jasadi mudgha idha salahat salah al-jasadu kullu wa idha fasadat fasad al-jasadu kullu ala wa hiya al-qalb this hadith, which is muttafaqun alay, which is reported in Bukhari and Muslim, has two great areas of benefit. I want to look at one of these areas of benefit and give you a, a full understanding of it. And the second one, open up a door. The first one is the shubha, the doubt. The hadith is saying, that which is lawful is clear, and that which is prohibited is clear, but between them are doubtful matters about which not many people know. This is the Prophet ﷺ speaking to us. So he who avoids the doubtful matters clears himself in regard to his religion and his honor. But he who falls in the doubtful matters falls into that which is prohibited, like the shepherd who pastures around the sanctuary all but grazing therein. Okay? So when you're in the doubtful areas, it's like a shepherd has the sheep, and the sheep are you know, around this sanctuary. They're not inside of it, but the sheep are grazing around. Right? They're grazing therein. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Surely every king has a sanctuary, and surely Allah's sanctuary on the earth is his prohibitions. Verily in the body there is a lump of flesh, which if it is, if it is in good repair, all of the body will be in good condition, and which, if it, is, if it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted, and that is the heart. And so, this uh, doubtful matter, which is causing such confusion, this is an example of what we need to understand. Number one, for those who have doubt about the hookah, which is the pipe itself, right, and the shisha, Right or the uh, nargil or, or the uh, goza or whatever the name is that you use for it. This is the block of uh, fruit that they put in, but underneath it is tobacco. So it has tobacco. And anybody who tells you that it doesn't have tobacco, you know, is trying to fool you because the smoke itself needs, uh, the fruit smell needs a medium to carry it. And, and, and that is what the tobacco actually brings. What, what doctors have found out now is that the smoke, which is being breathed in by the person who is smoking the hookah, it contains toxic elements. It contains tar, carbon monoxide, heavy metals, cancer-causing carcinogens. Right? These are the things which are in, in nicotine. And it is clear, the Surgeon General in America, they declared openly that, that nicotine, that the cigarettes, is causing serious uh, problems, health problems uh, within the community. It is cancer-causing, and there's no doubt about that now. But what people don't understand, that when a person um, you know, takes one, uh, one hour session in smoking the hookah, they are smoking sometimes uh, one to 200 times the amount of smoke is actually going into their body. Not one cigarette, they're smoking packs of cigarettes. The amount of smoke and the amount of the carcinogens that's going inside of the body. Some of the packages say the tar that is in this from the fruit, it's harmless. It can't do anything to you. And that is true. And the brother I was with, Jazawullah Khair, he showed very clearly, yes, it's true, but if you light the tar, once the heat hits it, then it turns into a dangerous uh, toxin, a dangerous po poison. So people are literally putting the poison in, which can cause lung cancer, mouth cancer, heart disease, because your arteries get clogged, also gum disease. Uh, a number of things can happen. Also, the pipe when the pipes are shared between people and not cleaned properly, they can also cause 
uh, infections, which include tuberculosis, lung infections, stomach ulcers. The doctors also found out that a person who is a regular smoker of this pipe, smoke going down into them, they found that uh, the, their babies will, will have a lesser weight. They studied the children of people who smoke and those who don't smoke and found that the children who smoke, their babies are three and a half uh, ounces uh, less in weight than the people who don't smoke. Secondhand smoke, the people who are around you, like smoking cigarettes or other things, they're affected by you. The smoke is in, the cl in your hands, in your hair, in your clothing. There's also a danger of nicotine addiction. Nicotine addiction. And this is something which is very, very serious uh, in terms of what it does to the lungs uh, and whatnot. They even found out that there's a danger to your skin. It causes wrinkling in the skin and it also causes sexual impotence, that the man becomes a weakling if he is smoking too much uh, uh, from this. And so based upon the fatwa of the High Committee uh, of Saudi Arabia at the time of Sheikh bin Baz, Rahimahullah, when they looked at the nicotine and they looked at the effect, whether it be in cigarettes or whether it would be in uh, uh, the, 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 the hookah pipe, they declared very, uh, very openly that uh, this is haram. Before, people said the nicotine is makru, meaning it is a hateful thing, which is still a terrible thing. It's still, makru is still the doubt, right? This is the mushabbahat. It's still the doubt, but the haram is very clear. So either way, it, it is wrong. But the ulama looked at the words of the Prophet who said, la dara wa la dirar, that you do not harm people, you do not harm yourself, and that clearly now it is harming the body. If there's any doubt in your mind, the World Health Organization found that in 2008, tobacco smoking, it's killing 5.4 million people per, per year. 14,000 people per day are dying from it. The shisha, it actually is worse. And Bahrain, in the country of Bahrain, the anti-smoking society, they made it very clear, they even found in some of the shisha pesticides used to kill insects and also radioactive uh, substances. Okay, that the burning of, of the tar, the toxic things, that the, you know, it is a danger. The water does not filter out um, um, those things uh, which are dangerous. And so it is very clear. The second part, which is interesting, that this hadith now is, is starting off showing that al-halalu bayin, right, and haram bayin, it's clear. But there's doubtful things in the middle, inside. That's the dangerous part for us, right? But the Prophet ﷺ said that the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beautiful fortress of Allah, is protected. It is, it is the things which are prohibited. That gives us a protection against the evils of the dunya. And so the person who falls in these doubtful things is like the shepherd who's around, making his flock come closer and closer. So when the person is in the doubtful area, they come closer and closer to falling into the haram area. Okay? But right after this, the Prophet ﷺ said, very important statement. And this statement has major implications for us. He said, in the fil jasad mudra, idha salahat, salah al jasadu kullu. Wa idha fasadat, he said that in the body there is a lump of flesh. If it goes right, the whole body is right. If it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted, and that is the heart. And this is an issue for us. And I put this to you, especially to the younger generation. We need to find out what it is that's happening to us. We are in a time of tafarruq, of separation. Muslims are separating from each other. Families separating, communities separating, countries separating, even Islamic movements, even people in the field are separating. There's something going on. We have to realize we are in a war. It's not necessarily a physical war. There's a spiritual war that is going on. And that is the dangerous struggle 
that we find ourselves in, which we, we can feel, the person can feel, well, I'm enjoying life. There's nothing wrong. But this thing is spreading. And so the heart itself. And for a long time, we looked at the issues of the heart. We tried to understand what this hadith said. Because the hadith said, mudra. It's a lump of flesh. So the first thing you think of with the mudra is that you think only what is pumping the blood inside of your body. And that is the essence of the physical heart. But when you read the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ, if you look at the ayat, you look at you know, the different verses from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're talking about something else. The heart is something else. And it is of crucial importance to us that we try to look at this, to study it, and to learn how to protect ourselves from the spiritual war which is happening, which sometimes you can't see it. It can be happening right around you at this point. We have to be able to defend ourselves. Otherwise, we will think that we are doing what is right, but we're actually being divided, we're actually being uh, subjugated and controlled right, from the inside. The heart itself, the doctors are finding out, is not just a lump of flesh. The heart itself, when the baby is formed, the first part in the embryo which, is, which, which comes into form is the cardiovascular system. And the heart itself has qualities. The cells of the heart have something that no other part of the body has. The cells are alive. They pulsate. There's a force inside of the cells of the heart. And it is the pumping of those cells which actually give life to the rest of the body. The doctors now, they can't describe what is in the heart. They call it the L force, the life force. That there's something inside of it which they don't know where it came from. We understand that there is a force inside of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, sends the malaika and they will put into the child a ruh, that the soul is inside of, of the baby from after the 120 days, that the soul is inside, that the life force is there. And it is this life force which unites us. The heart they understand now has its own brain. You see, we thought the brain was controlling the body. But the brain is like your computer. The heart itself has a type of elect electromagnetic force. They can measure the force coming out of your heart. It's electromagnetic force. And this is very interesting. Because the Prophet ﷺ, when people lined up, he's telling them, shoulder to shoulder. Be not divided. Let, so your hearts will not be divided. Why did he say your heart's not divided? You see? Why did he not say that you will not be divided? Why is this coming up? And you will see it coming in our sources. How crucial the heart is in terms of uh, where we are going. So the heart has its own uh, understanding. The heart has its own uh, 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 commands. And it actually gives commands to the brain. There are more decisions that are made in your heart than in your brain. People think, no, no, it's the brain. My brain is my computer. But the Prophet ﷺ, when a man came to him and asked him about bir, asked him about righteousness, he told him, istefti qalbak. Ask your heart. Why didn't he say, ask your mind? You see? Ask your heart. So the heart is the conscience. Why is this important what is inside of us? Because as we cry for change, Allah Azza wa Jal told us, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. So the change has to come about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the 22nd chapter, and you'll see many things about the heart. Very interesting in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَ الْأَبْصَارِ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَ الْقُلُوبِ 
التي في الصدور. Look at this. We read these verses. We have to try to understand what Allah is telling us. It said, do they not travel through the land so that their hearts may learn wisdom? يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا You see, it didn't say their brain. It said their hearts will learn wisdom, right? And their ears may thus learn to hear. Then Allah said, truly it is not their eyes that are blind, but their hearts that are in their chest. So a person could be blind physically, but they can see. Because their heart is the one that truly sees. You see, that is the spiritual side. Why is this important? Why is it important? Because the hearts can be diseased. And if the hearts are diseased, as, the, as we learned, everything is going to go wrong. إِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ Right? If they become corrupted and diseased, everything is going to go wrong. Everything will happen. And so, the crucial part of the heart, somebody will say, well, how can the heart be diseased? What are you talking about? Coronary heart disease? He had a heart attack? What are you talking about? <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions very clearly in Surah Al-Baqarah, and remember this, speaking about munafiqeen, Allah tells us, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَدْ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَدًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ So Allah said, in their hearts is a disease. And Allah will increase their disease. And they will have a terrible punishment because of the lies that they carry out. So the internal Muslim, the heart of the Muslim is crucial for us today to look inside of ourselves. And this is so important to us because there are clear lessons and the great ulama of Islam have looked into this like a doctor who looks at the physical part of the body. What are some of the diseases of the heart? One of the l biggest diseases of the heart is al-kibr. It is pride. And pride is when a person is proud of themselves, proud of their color, proud of their height, proud of their money, of their family's name, of the language that they speak. al kiba destroys. And the outward form, it starts on the inside. When the person feels, because I am from a such and such a family, then I deserve better than anybody else. You see now that there are a small group of people ruling the whole world. Why do they have millions and billions of dollars, but yet there are other people who are starving to death? Kibar. And it is pride, one of the original sins happening in the beginning of time, when the shaitan will iyadu billah, refused to bow down to Adam alayhi salam, and, he, and Allah asked him, why? He said, because you created me from fire, and you created him from clay. You see, pride. It was pride that knocked him out. And pride is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous quality. The Prophet ﷺ constantly, you will see if you look at his life, he struggled against the pride in individuals. He struggled against it even in himself. When they asked him, who are you? He said, I'm the son of one of your women. A very humble answer. When you come into Medina and you look at the circles, you can't even tell which one is Rasulullah ﷺ until he begins to teach. Right? So humility... Humility, strength, right? You're humble, but strong. That is the qualities that we want now. Okay? So pride is dangerous. The outward form of al kibba is takabbur. And that is the arrogance. And the person who is proud now, the arrogance shows, they look at people in a mean way, they kick them around, they think that they deserve more, they push people, that's the arrogance, right, that comes out, right? And this is a dangerous thing. A, it is a disease of the heart. It will corrupt and destroy everything in that person's life. 
how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? The ulama tell us, for all of these diseases of the heart, there is a knowledge cure and there is an action cure. The knowledge cure for pride is to reflect upon our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where did we come from? Look back at the human being. Once we were a tiny clot of blood, right? And now we stand up. People stand up and defy their Lord, right? But where did they start off? You see, very humble. And we, we come from a humble place. We get strong and then we get weaker and weaker and weaker and we will return. No matter how rich you are, how famous you are, you have to leave this earth in a humble way. You will come out of this earth. So what are we proud about? So the first thing is understanding who we are. It's interesting because think about our lives. Okay, especially a person who feels they're physically fit. At any moment, you can drop dead on the ground. There are some people who are professional football players, right? Super Bowl, that they're ready to play. Gladiators. And then one day he walks on the field and he just drops dead. Okay, he just has a heart attack and dies. You can drive in your, in your vehicle and gone in a minute. Even the richest person on earth, even the heads of state, will fly in the plane and suddenly the plane crashes. So none of us have really any control over our destiny, you see? So why are we proud? We should be thankful that Allah Azza wa Jal gave us life. We should be thankful for the things that we have. The second part of the cure is the action cure. And the action cure here comes in physically. If we can't control our pride, then we need to do things that humble us. Do hard physical labor. You'll see the Prophet ﷺ in the day of the Khandaq, when they were digging the trench, when the Ahzab was about to attack them, he was carrying the bricks himself. Right? Doing hard labor. Right? Taking the same as everybody takes. A simple life. It is reported Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, came into the house of the Prophet Sallallahu and, and Ibn Mas'ud was considered to be probably the, the closest to Rasulullah Sallallahu in the way he looked and the way he acted, the closest one. And he came inside of the house and he saw the Prophet Sallallahu and he saw the marks on his back and he said, can we not uh, give you a nice cushion or something? Can we do something for you? And he said, no, because we are Never forget, you're a traveler. We are travelers, we are here today and gone tomorrow. Right, so never make this. This is not our paradise, right? So the humility, this is the Prophet Sallallahu this is the best of creation, the leader of the prophets, right? So he gives us the example of humility. A group of brothers told me at one point they were looking for a great scholar of Hadith. He was living in India. And they went to the house and um, they sat down and an elderly man came out and gave them water and they washed their hands. Then the elderly man came and gave them food and they ate their food. Then they said, okay, where's the sheikh? Ten minutes later, the same elderly man came back and he said, I'm the sheikh. And he sat down and he began to teach. They were amazed at his knowledge. But you see what he did? He killed his pride. He killed his pride. He has knowledge an ocean of knowledge over them, right? But he served them like a slave, right? So he killed the pride within himself. So part of this issue of al-kibr, part of it is um, that we need to take action. We need to take action against this. The second one I want to look at with a little details because of time. This is a long uh, study, which inshallah we hope to do more with you. The second one I want to look at tonight, because this is an issue which is causing confusion. It's a disease of the heart. It has been recognized by the ulama as a disease of the heart. And that is al-ghadab. It is anger. Uncontrolled emotion. It's uncontrolled emotion. When the person now, because you differ with the opinion, right, or you say something against him, 
their blood starts to change. And they, it boils and their skin color changes. Sometimes the worst form, they foam at the mouth. They can't control their body. Right? This ghadab, when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ one time, he said, give me advice. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, la taghdab. Just don't get angry, man. Don't get angry. This anger is a serious thing. And the anger many times causes a confusion between us. And that is the thing that we need to be able to solve in order to resolve our conflicts. We have to resolve our conflicts. We have to be able to forgive each other. But ghadab, you see, when it keeps boiling up, it'll, it'll disease your heart. So your heart can't make the right decision, right? Your heart, which is the essence of you, becomes corrupted and spoiled. And so the ghadab itself is a terrible thing. And the knowledge cure, again the scholars look at the knowledge cure. Think about the anger itself. Why were you angry? What is the cause of the anger? Sometimes when you really look at the cause of the anger, right? It's not really a major thing. But sometimes you got hurt, right? But look at the example of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions who were driven out of their homes, who were killed, who were exiled. But yet they forgave the people of Mecca. They embraced them as their brothers and sisters. You see, they overcame the emotion of the ghadab because that is something which can cause a major confusion inside of our lives. Also, reflect upon the ghadab itself. What does it make us look like? Think about your form. When the person is angry, if you could take a camera and look at yourself again, Look at your face, right? Look at your actions when you're dealing with other people. And this ghadab can happen in the family. The man is angry with his wife, right? Parents angry with children. Now these days, the wife is angry at the man because some of the wives, they'll kick you out the house. I had a case of a sister in, in Los Angeles and she was a really tough sister, right? She was a tough sister. She was like black belt in karate. And she married a brother, he was a very mashallah brother, very humble, you know, spiritual brother, right? And she married him and she was submitting to him. And then she got a letter which came from Japan. I remember this case. The letter came from a girlfriend that he had in Japan. And she got the letter. And she called me at three in the morning and she said, Brother Abdullah, I just knocked him out. I knocked him out. What, what should I do? I said, subhanAllah, the sister knocked her husband out. Like, what do you do, right? That's not a normal case, right? All I could say to her is, la taqdab. Like, don't get angry. Control yourself. You have to control emotions, right? You have to control emotions. What is the action cure? The action cure, the scholars will tell us that if this anger comes on you now, Somebody might say something to you. You get into an argument. You say like, you know, my madhab is better than yours. You know, or this or that. You get in an argument, you start feeling it coming. He say, if you're standing up, sit down. Make it sti'adha min shaitan. Right? Seek refuge from the devil. If you're sitting down, lay down. Okay, make wudu. If that doesn't work, make wudu. Like put water on yourself, right? Make wudu but protect ourselves from this ghadab because it is causing a major confusion. And you can see that in our countries, many times it's this emotion which is causing major conflicts between our jamaats. And that is something that we as an ummah, as well as we as individuals have to deal with. The heart itself is a fortress. The scholars describe it as a fortress. And there are certain doors to enter the fortress. And they call this madakhil iblis. These are the way that the devil will come into your heart in order to deal with you. I want to just in conclusion uh, deal with a few. Because I think we're coming to a conclusion now. It's 45? You know what time it is? Yeah. I want to just give you a few. And inshallah in the future we can look at it. Al-Hasad. Jealousy. Uh, shahawat, desires. See, desires can come in your heart 
and destroy you. Also being too filled, this is an interesting point, the ulama even said, being too filled with food. Right? Being too filled. Don't be too satisfied. Also, atama, finas, and that is um, desiring people to give you glory and fame. You, you need people to say, oh, he's a good guy, he's a good... And you look now at people who become rock stars or athletes or whatever, most of them turn to drug addicts and criminals. Because they love the people and they lose their sense of the creator of the heavens and the earth. Haste, al-ajala. And the Prophet ﷺ even said, al-ajala min shaitan That doing things too fast is from the devil. So we need to, to, to have sense, take our time when we are doing things. Also, very interesting point. Ibn Qudama al-Maqtazi, rahimahullah, and many of the ulama looked at, they said one of the key entrances now is becoming too fanatic with our school of thought. It's ta'asub. Too fanatic with our Islamic movement or too fanatic with our school of thought. This is al sunnah wa jama'ah. But becoming al mutaasib you know, fanatical about my school of thought or about my Islamic movement, it is actually one of the ways that the devil is getting into our hearts. Also, adhan, suadhan, suspecting other people. We need to go back to the sunnah. We need to go back to the innocence of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam. Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu an, reported, there was three people in Quraysh. They were the best in character. They were the most prominent of the Quraysh. When they spoke to you, they tell you the truth. And when you speak to them, they do not accuse you of lying. Right? They don't suspect you. See it now? Innocence, right? When they speak to you, they'll tell you the truth. Not going to lie to you. And when you speak to them, they're not going to suspect you. If you lie though, they'll probably find out. But they're not going to suspect you. They have innocence in dealing with other people. And they were kathir al-haya. They had a lot of haya, modesty. They were very humble, modest people, but strong. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Uthman ibn Affan, and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. These are our shining examples. And this is the innocence of the sunnah. We need to go back to this to protect ourselves now. It is not the major things that are killing us. It's the shubuhat. It's the doubtful things in the middle and it is the diseases of the heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from these diseases. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, you know, have mercy upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts and accept us as believers. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for opportunity to be together and to worship in his house. And in the previous um, halaqa that we had, uh, I opened up a number of big areas. The Greeks would say you open Pandora's box. That means you opened up something that has a lot of areas in it, okay? So I want to open up the floor for any questions that anybody has in terms of um, you know, some of the points that I was talking about. Uh, the first issue was the issue of uh, you know, the shubuhat, the doubtful things, and in particular it was the hookah, the hookah and the shisha. And secondly is the issue of the importance of the heart. And this is where the study is opened up about the importance of the heart. In terms of other things, uh, everyday fiqh questions, uh, you have your local fuqaha and the imam is here, you know, for those, but in terms of these uh, questions surrounding this topic, the floor is open uh, for any questions that anybody has. Yes, brother. Feel free. This is a workshop. You know, don't don't feel like you're under pressure. If you have something on your mind, just ask the question. You can say it. I'll repeat it. Oh, okay. Okay. This is a little bit outside of the topic, I, and I don't want to stray too far outside the topic. 
But the question is just to get things going. You know, is it allowed to stand up for the national anthem? Now, the, this, of course, this is way out there and, uh, from the topic, right? And, um, but, you know, it'll get us going. Um, I'm not a mufti in the sense, but there was um, a position of the Council of Imams here uh, in Canada and it happened in other places, you know, where they said, um, you know, it is, it is permissible uh, to do that, to stand for the national anthem uh, and whatnot um, uh, here, you know, in Canada and other places like that. Um, because we are, in a sense, underneath, you know, we do have a, what they call a, a sulah. We're in Darul Sulah. We're in the, the abode of uh, treaty. We have a treaty with the people here, and we pay income taxes, and we stop at the red light, and we go at green light, right? You don't, you don't go when you see the red, right? You follow, you know, the basic rules of the society. So there's nothing wrong with doing that, knowing that our ultimate allegiance is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very clear. Uh, but the, the council did make a decision that it is, it is permissible uh, you know, to do that. Now, any other general questions? Yes, brother. Yeah. Well, you know, food definitely is um, considered to be, and this is why one of the points, which I didn't go in details, was that the scholars are saying that, you know, you should never eat constantly till you're fully satisfied. Because being totally satisfied uh, can bring on other things as well. So um, if you look at the lifestyle of the Prophet, وسلم, you know, they didn't eat meat that often, um, you know, and very simple. Uh, and what not. Um, yeah, so, so, so there is something with, you know, too much food, loving the food itself. Eating, they say you, you eat not just to live, but you live to eat. Some people live for the next meal, so they can enjoy the next meal, right? This is not um, the way we should. But I wouldn't put it on meat eaters or non-meat eaters, because um, there's some very violent vegetarians around. Very violent, you know, in India and other places. Very violent vegetarians. Uh, and I wouldn't put it on spice or not, too, because spicy people, spicy food can make you, you know, angry. But there are people who live in non-spicy zones, like Russia, they don't like spice, right? But there's some very violent people in Russia. And their food does not have much spice. So, so it's, it's something other than that, you know, really, that, you know, inside the, indi the individual. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the question is the methods that we talked about, you know, with the anger in terms of the cure, will it will get rid of it or will it uh, just, you know, control it? Um, you know, things like anger, emotion, it is constantly with us. So that, that emotion that you have on issues, you know, it is constantly with us. So they say that, you know, there is sometimes too much emotion, which can turn to ghadab, and sometimes there's too little emotion. So people who have too much emotion, you know, just any little issue and they burst out and talking loud and, you know, you know, getting, you know, really, and too little is, some people listen and they see that, you know, a thousand people are killed in this country, another bomb, and they just say, well, you know, malish, it's nothing, you know, whatever. You know, they don't have enough emotions, especially when they see that Islam is under attack or Muslims are suffering. You know, but what, what, what we want is the balanced emotion you know, where the person has the emotion for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it comes at the right time. So it doesn't get rid of the anger completely, but it helps the person to control anger, to control it. A brother came to me one time uh, in a counseling session and um, without mentioning countries or names or anything, but um, he and his wife had a very serious problem. And um, she was a small, short sister, but very fiery. And he was a tall brother, well built, and um, she would get him angry. She knew how to get him angry. 
And, and whenever she got him angry, he would hit her. So she had a problem too, actually, because she was making him angry, right? She knew exactly what to say. He comes in, maybe he had trouble at his job, he lost his job, and she'd look at him and say, you little boy. You know, she'd know how to like, make him feel like really bad, right? His ghadab, his anger, and then strike. Okay? So he said, they came to me and they said, can you solve this problem? I said, I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, you know, psychologist, but what I can give you is what the scholars have said about ghadab. Right? So first off, the first thing looking at this is that she has to look into herself you know, and not get him angry in order to get his attention. Because sometimes people will get somebody angry just because they want their attention. That's the wrong way to do it. Okay? But secondly, we use the system. If he feels it bubbling up inside of himself, then you know, seek refuge. Make his ta'adha min shaitan A'udhu billah min shaitan It's really bad even spit over your left shoulder. Because the evil jinni, you can get bothered from the left side. Okay, when you're standing up, sit down, sit down, lay down, you know, put water on yourself, make wudu. I, I gave him another thing. I said, if you still feel the anger, leave the room. Don't stay in there with her, right? You got to leave the room. And so they took that, and um, they seemed to be getting better. Alhamdulillah, they never came back again, you know, after the second time. They, they seemed to be okay. Um, so it can work. These things are not just for entertainment. They'll actually work. And there's something psychologically with when you're standing and when you're sitting and lying in terms of your blood, the boiling of your blood, right, in your body, and then also the heat of your body making wudu the water, cooling yourself off, right? There's something physical about this that can also help you to, um, you know, calm down the rage that is in it. Because there's too much rage in our ummah. You have people, when they insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the cartoons, right? Then people jumped out in the streets and they're hitting themselves and hitting everybody and they're angry. They're actually killing each other and whatnot. But that didn't stop the cartoons, man. They said they want to boycott and everything like that and, you know, they're in a rage. And I remember one time we had a demonstration and the brother was, you know, saying death to America, death to the West. And I looked at him, he had, he had a, a, a Nike hat, Levi shirt, uh, Nike, you know, shoes, eating McDonald's and drinking Coca-Cola. I say, you're saying death to the West? You are the West. The first thing to do is stop drinking Coca-Cola and eating McDonald's, man. You, you know, make a change in your own lifestyle, right? Instead of just emotions, right? So emotions have to be in the right time and the right amount and the right place. That's really important for Muslims today. Yes, brother. Okay, the question is, um, if a non-Muslim came and, um, you know, said to, you know, asked about cigarette smoking, you know, how would you explain to him our position without driving him away? The first thing is that, you know, we, we need to, um, you know, confirm with him, you know, that, you know, our belief is based on the Creator, that we follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, La dara wa la dara. He said, you shouldn't be harming people and you should not harm yourself. Don't do anything to harm yourself. So any chemicals or drugs or anything which is harming us, that this is a, a basic principle in our fiqh that, that we, we do not uh, get involved in that. And cigarettes is clearly proven. Take a pack of cigarettes and look on it. They have to say on it. It's dangerous, right? They have to put it on the cigarette. So it's very clear to people. Um, the reason why they don't stop is because they have a nicotine addiction. They need the nicotine, right? And so, you know, it's easy, you know, you explain it to him that we're following the commandments of our religion and the logic in it is that we don't, you know, harm our bodies. And that's better, that's better for you. That would be better for all of us, okay? Our problem is today, one of our problems with dawah is when we're explaining uh, Islam to people, we have to show them Islam is one thing and Muslims are another. Islam is the right way, but Muslims don't always follow Islam. 
Because you might say smoking cigarettes or shisha is haram or makru. Some scholars say makru, meaning hateful, right? Both of them are bad. And then he goes outside and sees Muslims smoking smoke and cigarette. Or he sees somebody smoking shisha. So at least he knows that Islam is one thing and the practice of Muslims is another. All of us are weak and we're all, we're all trying to you know, get ourselves together. You know, but, but try to give that person a fresh you know, dose or, or, or a drink of the water of Islam. Fresh water. You know, and and don't, hide, don't hide anything you know, from that person. Now, the floor is open for any other uh, questions or uh, comments anybody has. The floor is open. Yes, please. Things like that. constant struggle within those two things coming to that one thing, right? Which is the demand. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how would you say we, we, we constantly gear ourselves to keep that struggle because it is a struggle you know, for everyone, for all of us. Yeah, the question is how do we, you know, you know, uh, gear ourselves that we constantly, you know, are aware of our hearts, you know, and we're struggling, you know, to purify our hearts. This is the blessing of Islam. Because, you know, we need to look at Islam as a total package. One of the problems many people have is they look at Islam as only certain actions. So there are some people who practice Islam, say for instance in Ramadan, right? So they're around Ramadan, it's a person we call Abdul Ramadan. Instead of Abdullah, the slave of Allah, they're the slave of Ramadan, right? So they'll practice only in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan they don't practice. And sometimes they'll fall into worse problems after Ramadan. So it's a whole package. In other words, everything that we do, when we are saying, you know, uh, the oneness of, of, of Allah in our shahada, you know, we are constantly purifying our aqidah, right? That you believe in one God, you only follow the Prophet Sallallahu ultimately, you know, and you have to constantly purify that. Think about it strengthen it, okay? And it's a type of purification. Secondly, when we pray, it's actually a form of purification. So that, that's a purification of the heart, meaning the whole self. So the wudu itself, if it's done properly, you know, and we're thinking about what we're doing when we're making the wudu, right? The prayer itself, if we consciously pray, and that means not just praying as an exercise, but consciously think about all the actions. Think about the words that we're saying in the Arabic language, right? Make du'as which are, you know, meaningful things, right? If we consciously do that, then it's a form of tezkiyah also. It's a form of purification. Fasting in Ramadan obviously is a purification. It purifies the body, the spirit, everything. Zakat is actually from, is tezkiyah, it's the same word. Zakat is the purification of our wealth. So that if we purify our wealth, you know, then we're actually, that, that keeps us up, you know. And then the Hajj itself is a purification to the extent where if the person performs the Hajj properly, they will come back like a newborn baby. The constant dhikrullah, remembrance of Allah. Dhikrullah is not something just in a halaqa, but dhikrullah is constantly. We're saying Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, A'udhu Billah, MashaAllah, InshaAllah, constantly saying dhikrullah. The more it's coming from us in all the actions that we do, it's a purification. You see, the evil way that the shaitan gets, or Iyadu Billah in this society, 
they do dhikr as shaitan wa iyadu billah. And they swear. And if you look at the essence of what a swear is, a swear is usually something nejis, something filthy, or it's, or it's you know, uh, humiliating a woman. You know, it's something filthy, right? So the shaitan wants you to have filth in your mind, right? It's filth in the mind, and then the person eats haram food, filth in the body, right? Filth in the eyes from watching things wrong. And so that corrupts the heart. So when we are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, eating hal the halal foods, keeping up with the prayers, the whole package, then it is a form of purification. It does not mean that we will not get attacked. We are naturally doing that. Or, or we're naturally getting attacked. But at least we're, we can purify ourselves and we can, um, you know, uh, make a stick of fire. And the Prophet ﷺ would make, we ask a lot for forgiveness at least a hundred times per day. So this is another thing. So to look at our Islam as a constant activity during the day. It's a constant purification. It, it has an effect on everything that we're doing in our life. If that's the case, then, you know, the heart stays fresh. It's fresh and it's sound. And, you know, this heart is so important, you see in Surah Al-Shu'ara, that it's, when it speaks about the Day of Judgment, Think of now the day of judgment when the person is coming. You know, meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, um, Yoma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. Right? So it is the day, right, that your wealth and your children will have no benefit. La yanfa. So there's no benefit at all except for somebody who comes with a sound heart. And this is important because when we say La ilaha illallah, right? That's a powerful statement in Arabic. Because you're saying La ilaha. So it starts off with a uh, negation. Right? So it's a negation. La ilaha. So when you do that, you have negated all idols, all forms of worship. There's nothing there, right? Then you say, illa. And then you put Allah. So by doing that, you clean the slate, right? It's a powerful Arabic statement. And then you put Allah in there, so therefore, there should be no other forms of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here in this case, it's saying on this day, la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. It said that your wealth La yanfa, so it starts with negativity. Same thing. Nothing's going to benefit you. Your wealth's not going to benefit you. Your children's not going to benefit you. Illa. There it is again. So you're getting no benefit. Illa man etallaha bi qalbin salim. The one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. That's how serious this thing is, man. This thing is really serious. Like we put a lot of emphasis on our clothing on slogans and on things, but the inside Muslim, what's inside of us, this is the determining factor in this world and in the hereafter. It's a determining factor, right? And, and, and this is where we have to really, you know, pu purify ourselves. Think about the young baby. Think about the young baby, innocent, right? The innocence. This is the concept of haya means. You're innocent and friendly. The best example of this hayat, or one of the best examples that I found, is the great Sahabi Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. They say that he was, he had a lot of haya. He was very modest. Very, you could, you could put, put your head in his lap. He was like humble and modest, right? Now here in this society, if you are modest and humble, you're usually weak. That's what usually comes with that. Okay? Modesty, humility, shame, weakness. Right? But he is modest and humble from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not you. He's not afraid of you, right? His modesty is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was described as the sharp side of the sword. That's how they describe Abu Ubaidah. So when danger came, he turned into a lion. Right? So he's the kind of person, he's very humble, very simple, polite. When danger comes, he goes right at it. You see? That's the character of a Muslim. 
We're not brag, brag it, show off, arrogant, right? You're humble, you're easy, easy going with everybody. Forgive, man. Be easy, right? But when danger comes, when wrong comes, that's when we're strong in the face of evil, right? See, too many people, it's the other way around. When they're around Muslims, they're really tough. They look at the Muslim stock for Allah, brother. You know, your pants, you're here. And then they come outside to the non-Muslim, Hello, Jane. How are you today? Right? We have to be balanced with this, right? You've got to be balanced in how we deal. Now, any uh, other questions? Floor is open for any uh, other questions anybody has. Floor is open. Bravery? Yeah. Okay, very good question. How do you develop bravery? How do you develop bravery? Um, really, um, the key issue in this matter is to reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the more we fear Allah, the more, I mean fear in the sense of we re ultimately respect we fear Allah's punishment, then the less you're going to fear creation. And this is what you'll see in the lives of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They were not actually all six feet tall. Some of them are very short. As I said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, right? Who's the master of the Qur'an. He was a short man from southern Arabia, right? And he had very skinny legs. He's not a big man, right? And one day they were in Medina, and he was climbing, the, uh, the, you know, the, the palm trees are there. And so he was climbing the palm tree. And the Sahaba looked at his leg and they started laughing at his legs. Look at his skinny legs. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't laugh because one of his legs on the day of judgment will be like Mount Uhud. One of his legs. Right? So it, it's not about the size of your body. Right? But it is you know, your relationship with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, skills development that we need to develop ourselves and it is part of the sunnah for you to learn to, to develop your body right to learn how to uh, defend yourself to learn how to swim how to ride gain skills the more skills that you have right is the more confidence you have in yourself okay so this is important gain confidence in the self and also uh, uh, you know come closer to the creator of the heavens and the earth Right? Because, you know, uh, uh, you know f uh, real strength, real courage, is, uh, as, as some people who really been in dangerous situations, they said courage is not the absence of fear. In other words, courage is not not having fear. Right? Everybody has fear. You'll see some of the brothers who give the khutbas. I'm talking about myself too, right? You say, well, that person's very confident and whatnot. But anytime a person does that, you feel nervous. Because you're a human being, right? So courage is not the absence of fear. But it is controlling the fear. It is doing the action in the presence of fear. That's courage. So it's not, not having fear. You're going to have fear. But the real courage is you will continue on even though you're afraid. That's courage. Okay? And this is what we're looking for. So, again, strengthen ourself, uh, our, our taqwa, our relationship consciousness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also skills development, personal development, is extremely important for self-confidence. We have to build up our confidence. You know, and, and that requires, you know, education. Study, educate yourself, learn your history, you know, learn you know, your, your aqidah, learn your fiqh, educate yourself. The more you educate yourself, the more confidence that you will have uh, inside of yourself. Now, any other general questions uh, anybody has? Floor is open. Yes, brother. How do you stop the bad habits? The bad habits? Okay, um, that's a very broad question. But in the case of pride, right, the what the, what the great scholars have shown us is, first thing, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? 
We believe that Allah has power over all things. We believe that Allah you know, sees all things. Allah is not here above seven heavens, but in a way that is only known by Allah, Allah sees everything that we're doing and knows everything that we're doing. Okay? So if you have that feeling about you, right? Then the more you culture this and, and keep thinking about this. I remember I was with one of the Imams, we were in Los Angeles, California. And the Imam uh, Jazawallah, I'm not gonna say what his name is, you know, very, very nice brother. Then we're driving along and we were going onto one of the freeways. They have big highways in Los Angeles. So we're going onto the freeway and I noticed him, he was stiff. He was a little bit stiff. You know, and normally he's joking with me, right? And he was stiff like this and he's, he's driving perfectly like this and put on a signal and whatever. And then, so I said, um, you know, Imam, what's going on? He said, LAPD. <laughs> LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department. The police were in back of him, right? <laughs> now, if you think about that, when you're driving your car, right? And you turn your corners and you do everything. Most, most of us, we see the yellow light and we go right through it, right? If the police was in back of you, right? How would you act? You're a good Canadian. You come to the yellow and you slow down and put your signal on everything, right? Because you feel the presence of the police. Think about that, right? Now imagine if you can feel the presence or begin to understand the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows everything you're doing, right? Everything. Then how can you do something wrong? It's just like if the police are there, right? Are you going to pick somebody's pocket? And the police is standing there looking at you. You can't because you're thinking the police, right? You've got to be a good citizen. So the more you have that taqwa, that's what taqwa is. It's made up of, it's called al-khawf wa raja. It has like fear and hope in it, right? So if you have that consciousness of Allah, then it will help us to stop from doing wrong. Because when we're doing wrong things in secret and in the open, it's the same for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing is, think about the Creator. Secondly, when, when you're doing the bad habit, Think about your form. Think about what you look like when you're doing it. Think about yourself, right? If you could take a picture of yourself and see you when you're doing this wrong, you would be ashamed, right? So just think about how you look when you're actually doing this thing, you know, which is wrong, like that. So with that type of thinking, it's, it's a consciousness, right? It's like self-analysis, man. Analyze yourself, right? And come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we need. You know, today, the more you, you, uh, you gain this, you know, is, is, the, is the easier it will be to stay away from, you know, uh, wrong deeds and whatnot. Nobody is free of wrong deeds, uh, even the people who claim to be the best. It says, uh, Shaq, you mentioned how much damage shisha can bring, as you can briefly explain the damage pornography does to us as well. One of the madakhil iblis, well, yadu billah, one of the entrances into the fortress of the heart is shahwat. It is desires. Shahwa. These desires that human beings have is an entrance. And one of the most dangerous desires that we have is the sexual desire. I'm going to be straightforward. After the will to survive, if somebody's going to kill you, if a dog, if you're walking down the street and a bull terrier pit bull is in back of you, coming at you. You're going to run so fast, right? You would beat Usain Bolt. You would leave Usain Bolt in back. Because that pit terrier is in back of you, right? That's the will to survive, right? People will do amazing things when your life is... the sec One of the most powerful desires after is the sexual desire. That is the reason why in most of the sins, you'll see that Allah said... You know, do not take interest. La taqtulun nafs allati haram Allah. Do not kill people, you know, uh, you know, who don't deserve it. You know, but in, in the case of adultery, Allah said, wa la taqrabu zina. Innahu kana fahishatan wa sa'a sabila. Don't come near it. You see? Don't come near it. He didn't say don't do it. He said don't come 
near it. Okay, why? Because the, the, the relationship of male to female, it's a natural thing. You're supposed to have this feeling. If you don't have this feeling, something's wrong with you, man. So it's a natural thing. So if you come close to it, you're going to do it. That's why Allah said, don't come close to it. And that's the reason why today, the fitna, and this one the Prophet ﷺ said, the whore al fitan that the, 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 the trials and temptations would come out as we go to the day of judgment. This fitna of digital technology, the handheld devices, it is probably one of the greatest fitnas that we're facing today. Because remember the haya, right? When a person watches pornography, their haya is broken down. Because they are seeing things that, you know, in the past, we never, nobody would see, except in the most extreme cases. I'm going to give you an example, because I know that all of you watch TV and you see movies. There used to be a television program on in North America called I Love Lucy. And in this program, Lucy and her husband could not be seen in the bed at the same time. Could you imagine this? This is American television. According to the ethics of their, of the, uh, of their television, they could not show Lucy and her, her husband on television in bed at the same time. Now look what they're doing on television. Now when you open up your cell phone, look at what has happened in front of you. This is what we used to call like XXX, blue movie, whatever. You have to be extremist to watch that. Now it is in front of everybody. So therefore, we have to take pride, not pride, but we have to be, we have to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we avoid it. If you look away from pornography, you're actually stronger than the person who's looking at it. And the more you look away from it, is the more you will be able to have a natural relationship when you get married. The problem is today, because people watch so much pornography, right? they cannot have a natural relationship with anybody. Because their mind has been so polluted and it's been destroyed. So the more you cut it out, the more you look away, the more you are not involved, you're actually strengthening yourself. So try not to watch it at all. Try to get it away. I know it's difficult with these handheld devices because they're popping this thing up everywhere, man, on the internet. And th th this, is the, this is the thing. You've got to watch this out. Why is, the important, why is haya important? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتَ If you don't have haya, then do what you want to do. In other words, you're capable of doing anything. Once the limits are broken down, you can do anything. That's the reason why it's such a heavy attack on us. So we need to try to avoid this. And I know it's difficult. Right now they say, in 2006, way back then, they said pornography brought in $97 billion. That's how much money. $97 billion on pornography. That's how much money they're making. And the most people who are watching it are young people between the ages of 12 to about 19 years old or so. They're targeting you. They're targeting you, man. Because they want to take away the haya. Once they take away your modesty and your limits, then you're broken down. You're capable of doing anything, right? So it's really important to try to avoid this. When it does come, the first look is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second look, when you look back, that's the shaitan, right? So if it pops up, you know, a'udhu billah, turn away. Remember, your head is going like this, right? You want to go back, right? That's the shaitan pulling it, right? So that's, that's the, the wrong one. First one, okay. But look away. And try to avoid the websites or the, you know, the areas you know, that, that would bring that up you know, into your life. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good question. The question is, what if somebody, um, like in Facebook or something like that, 
it comes up. Follows. I mean, I mean, I have seen things, unbelievable things. You have pictures of the Haram of Mecca, people making tahajjud, and then they'll put something on the side. That's the shaitan trying to get in, right? So I'm saying that, like, um, you know, we can't throw away the internet completely, because this has become the means of communication of people in this generation, right? But it is just to try to learn how to avoid it, stay away from it as much as, much as we possibly can, you know, and, um, uh, uh, you know, to purify ourselves from it as much as we can. But it's almost, it's like you go outside, right? If you go outside and, you know, it may be on the billboards, it may, it may be walking down the street, right? The only way, I mean, to really ultimately stop it is throw away the cell phone, Go to the Sahara in the desert and just remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the top of a mountain, man. Really, that that's the point where the fitna has come. You know? But I think it's good though, people should get used to, you know, not being around their cell phone. You know, and the other day, you know, I um, left my cell phone in the house, you know, and I drove out, whatever, and I said, Oh, I don't have my cell phone. But then I said, well, wait a minute. Most of my life I didn't have a cell phone, man. Because <laughs> I was born in BC, right? They used to say like cavemen, no, before computers, right? <laughs> but BC, um, that's only in the 90s, right? Computers only came in the 90s, right? Before that, nobody carried a cell phone. You got to be like James Bond or something. You got to be a secret agent to be carrying some kind of device where you can like contact anybody in the world, you know, immediately by flipping the thing. You have to be a secret agent or something. Now everybody's carrying this thing. So, you know, it, it is a major fitna. We have to, you know, ask a lot of them to forgive us for this and protect us. But get used to not having it. Sometimes if you don't have it, you'll actually feel better. You'll actually feel better. You, you miss a lot of the things that, you know, might have come, you know, when you, when you have it. So sometimes we should just turn them off. You know, put it somewhere. If you're going to have a nice retreat with the brothers, you know, or the, or the sisters have a retreat or you know, whatever, take all the cell phones right before you go to the retreat and put them in a basket and leave them there. And then also, um, nobody will know where you are too, right? Because <laughs> when you have one of those GPS, they, you know, they're, they're watching you, NSA, right? They're watching everything you do. Right. Now, any other uh, general questions? Uh, yes, mother. Well, basically, you, you should. Everybody's beard is not the same. Some people have sparse beards. Some people have thick beards. You know, but you basically, you know, try to culture your mustache, you know, and leave the beard as much as you can. You know, there's different discussions about maybe, you know, you know, a little bit. If it gets, you know, too long, you can, you know, trim it, a, you know, a hand or you know, whatever like that. But but to try to keep it as natural as you possibly can. There was one brother from, um, I think he was from Malaysia or something like that. He had one hair. And he said, I'm keeping my hair. And he kept his one hair long like that. You know, because he wanted to keep his beard. Alhamdulillah. I think this will be the last question. Uh, yeah. Someone just asked me about the Jihad and the Nazi He said, it, it, uh, are his pants clean? No, like it's, uh, you know, like the snow when it snows, the mud. Right. So uh, it came on his pants. So the mud came on his pants. So it's dry. And it's dry. dry. Okay, I mean, the, the majority of the scholars, I mean, basically the, the, the scholars say that, you know, if it's dry, then whatever najasa is in it, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. You can pray with it. Unless you know that there was definitely najasa you saw. Then if it's dry, then you got to clean it off because you definitely saw it. But otherwise, if it's dry, it's okay as long as it's dry. Yeah. Yes, the brother with the hat. How do you gain self-respect and pride? Self-respect, you know, is when you um, you're not ashamed of yourself as a human being. This society here is breaking us down, especially the, the visual things where people are ashamed of their color. And it's actually the shaitan, well, at the beginning of time, he said, I will make them change the creation of Allah. 
I'll make them change. That's one of the ways he's going to defeat us, is to make us not satisfied with our creation. So people are not satisfied with their hair or their skin or, you know, whatever. So, you know, we should be satisfied however Allah made us, then we should say, Alhamdulillah, you're not ashamed of this, right? And you're not proud in the sense, proud is arrogance. Proud is pride that the kibba is when you think you're better than somebody. You see? Because of what you are, you think you're better. That's the kibber. That's the one that we have to, you know. But for you to respect yourself and how Allah made you and who you are, respect your language, respect your family, you know, that is required. You know, as a Muslim, you're supposed to know your nasab. If you're going to get married, one of the questions that the sister's wali is going to ask you is, where's your family, man? What's your nasab? Where you come from? So you need to know who your family is. You need to respect yourself and your roots, as they say. But don't think that, you know, whoever you are makes you necessarily better than everybody else. So with this, we'll close our halaqa now uh, there. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, forgive us uh, and purify our hearts. Aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah wa walakum. Subhanaka Allahumma bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Wa akhira da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and press the bell icon below. Have a nice day.